In the late 1990s, Arizona became a punchline. Scientists released beavers onto scorched, dead riverbanks, and the world scoffed. The official story said these rodents couldn't fix a landscape stripped bare by fur trappers, dams, and decades of overgrazing. But when beaver dams began reviving the San Pedro River, reversing a collapse that had threatened over 350 bird species and triggered a groundwater freefall, old assumptions were shattered. If animal engineering and smarter grazing could bring a dying river back to life here, what else have we been wrong about in the fight against desertification? The shocking truth behind Arizona's gamble starts where most gave up, at the edge of ecological ruin. Long before the desert crept in, the San Pedro River ran green and alive, shaped by the work of beavers. These animals weren't just another species along the banks, they were the original engineers, building dams that slowed the river, spread water into side channels, and created deep pools where willows and cottonwoods thrived. Their ponds supported a riot of life, frogs, dragonflies, and birds by the hundreds. Generations of beavers turned the river into a living chain of wetlands, each dam acting as a safety valve against drought and flood. But by the late 1800s, a new kind of hunger swept North America. Beaver pelts, once traded by the handful, suddenly became currency for hats, coats, and profits stretching from London to New York. Trappers arrived with steel traps and rifles, setting lines that ran for miles. In less than a century, beavers vanished from the San Pedro, their bodies shipped out in barrels. The fur trade didn't just take the animals, it erased the dams, drained the wetlands, and left behind a river stripped of its natural breaks. The damage didn't stop with the trappers. In the 1920s, as farming expanded and irrigation became king, people turned to dynamite. Official records and old newspapers describe how crews blasted the last beaver dams to clear water for crops and to fight malaria, fearing that standing pools bred mosquitoes. The explosions sent walls of water rushing downstream, carving new channels and tearing out the roots of old trees. What had once been a slow, meandering stream became a deep, raw trench. Water that used to linger now vanished underground or rushed away in a flash. By the middle of the 20th century, the San Pedro's fate was sealed. Without beavers, the river lost its memory. No more wetlands to store rain, no layered pools to recharge the groundwater. The birds that once flocked to the valley started to disappear. Cottonwoods died standing, their roots starved for water. Each dry season grew longer, and the land itself began to crack and fade. The story of the San Pedro isn't just about a missing animal, it's about the loss of an entire way of life, of natural engineering that held a fragile landscape together. When beavers disappeared, the river's resilience vanished with them. Their absence set the stage for a collapse no one saw coming, and for decades, the idea of bringing them back seemed almost laughable. By the 1970s, the San Pedro River was a shadow of its former self. What had once been a ribbon of green through the desert now shrank to a trickle for most of the year. Springs dried up, and stretches that once ran year-round turned into cracked mudflats by midsummer. The riverbanks, stripped of beaver dams and shaded pools, became easy targets for cattle. Decades of unmanaged grazing hammered the soil, turning rich floodplains into hardpan. Hooves trampled young willows before they could take root, and thirsty cows chewed what little green remained. With every passing season, the river's thread of life grew thinner. The damage didn't stop at the water's edge. The San Pedro had been a lifeline for over 350 bird species, more than almost any other river in the American Southwest. But as the cottonwoods died and the willows vanished, the birds lost their nesting sites and food sources. Endangered flycatchers and yellow-billed cuckoos, once common, became rare sightings. Even the insects and frogs that fed them began to disappear. The valley's famous migration spectacle, waves of songbirds funneling north and south each year, grew quieter. Local naturalists started calling the river an ecological ghost town. Every year without beavers, the riverbed cut deeper. Floods that once fanned gently across the valley now roared through a single, scoured channel, carrying away soil and seeds. The water table dropped. Wells that had served ranches for generations ran dry. Old-timers recalled when you could dig a shallow pit and hit water. By the 1980s, you needed a drilling rig. 
Even in wet years, the land seemed thirsty. The river's memory of abundance faded from living experience to rumor. Wildlife clung on, but just barely. Jackrabbits and coyotes prowled the bare banks, but the lush mosaic of ponds and meadows was gone. In dry months, cattle crowded the shrinking pools, churning the mud and fouling the last water for miles. The few remaining trees leaned over the banks, roots exposed, waiting for the next collapse. For scientists and birders, the San Pedro became a case study in loss, a warning of what happens when a keystone species vanishes and nothing fills the gap. By the late 20th century, the river's collapse was so complete that some called it beyond saving. On maps, it still traced a blue line across southern Arizona. On the ground, it was becoming just another stretch of dead land. Late in 1999, a convoy of trucks rumbled down desert roads under cover of darkness, carrying an unusual cargo. Wooden crates lined with straw, each one holding a live beaver. Mark Fredlake, a biologist with the Bureau of Land Management, led the operation. He and his team from Arizona Game and Fish had spent weeks preparing, trapping the animals on the Verde River, running health checks, and keeping them cool and calm during quarantine. Beavers are sensitive to heat and stress, so every detail mattered. The timing wasn't random either. Releases happened at night when temperatures dropped and the riverbank was quiet, giving the animals their best shot at slipping into their new world without panic. Fifteen beavers in total were released over several nights between 1999 and 2002, each one carefully carried to the water's edge and coaxed from its crate. Some were set free near the San Pedro house, others farther south by Hereford, in spots chosen for their deep pools and thick stands of willow. Fred Lake and the team watched as the first beavers slipped into the water, vanishing into moonlit pools. For a river written off as dead, this wasn't just an experiment. It was a gamble that nature's oldest engineers could do what decades of human effort had failed to accomplish. The logistics were daunting. Every animal needed a clean bill of health. Transport cages were custom-built to keep the beavers safe, but not overheated. Even the drive was planned to avoid the worst of the desert sun. It took coordination across agencies, late-night phone calls, and a willingness to try something most experts doubted would work. But as the last crate opened and the final beaver paddled away, Fred Lake's team knew the real test was just beginning. The animals were on the ground, and the San Pedro had its first chance at healing in nearly a century. It didn't take long for the newcomers to get to work. Within weeks of their release, the first beaver dams began to appear. Muddy barricades woven with willow branches, packed tight with stones and sticks. Each dam worked like a speed bump for water, slowing the river's rush and spreading it sideways into the thirsty ground. Pools formed behind the barriers, turning narrow channels into broad, calm wetlands. The river's flow, once quick to vanish after a storm, now lingered in pockets that soaked deep into the soil. This slowdown effect did more than just hold water on the surface. As ponds deepened, cool water seeped into the earth, recharging the aquifer beneath the valley. Old-timers noticed wells near beaver ponds stayed fuller, even during dry spells. Scientists monitoring the river found that groundwater levels rose near new dams, a sign that the land itself was regaining its memory of abundance. The dams also acted as natural filters. Silt and sand, once carried away in muddy floods, settled out in the still water, building up fertile banks and trapping pollutants before they could travel downstream. Floods, which used to carve new scars into the riverbed, lost much of their force. The beaver-built wetlands absorbed the shock, spreading out high flows and reducing the risk of sudden erosion. In the hottest months, these ponds became cool refuges for fish and frogs. Even the air felt different, cooler and more humid above the water, a small but vital shift in a desert climate. Every stick placed by a beaver was a small act of restoration, turning barren stretches into a patchwork of life. The river's transformation, once thought impossible, began not with machines or concrete, but with teeth and mud. By 2006, the San Pedro was no longer just a test site for beaver reintroduction. It was a living showcase. In less than a decade, those first 15 beavers had multiplied, spreading out along the river and raising more than 30 dams. Each new dam stitched together another patch of wetland, turning dry stretches into a mosaic of ponds and slow-moving channels. The change was visible from the air. 
What had been a thin brown ribbon became a shimmering chain of green oases, even in the hottest months. Wildlife responded almost immediately. Biologists with the USGS began to count the difference, not in single sightings, but in waves. Where beavers built, bird numbers soared. Thirteen riparian bird species, including the endangered southwestern willow flycatcher and the yellow-billed cuckoo, rebounded with nearly 50% higher counts compared to stretches without beavers. Insects and frogs returned to the pools, drawing in swallows and kingfishers, while dragonflies stitched blue lines over the water. The beaver ponds became nurseries for life that had vanished decades before. By around 2010, the population had climbed to over 100 beavers, with new colonies popping up far from the original release sites. Some animals traveled more than 100 river miles, crossing dry washes and even slipping into Mexico. Local volunteers told stories of spotting beaver tracks in places no one expected, proof that these engineers were not just surviving, they were thriving and exploring. The valley's famous migration spectacle began to recover too. Each spring and fall, flocks of songbirds returned to the green corridors, their calls echoing over water that only recently had been dust. For a river once written off as dead, this was a comeback. Few had dared to imagine. Then came the flood. In September 2008, a wall of water tore down the San Pedro, wiping out nearly every beaver dam, over 30 in all, gone in a single surge. The river, once stitched together by ponds and wetlands, snapped back to a fast, cutting flow. Camera traps and survey crews found beaver lodges abandoned, some washed out entirely. For a moment, it looked like everything built over years could be erased overnight. Some biologists counted fewer than 15 beavers left in the entire stretch by the end of the next decade. The reasons piled up. Mountain lions prowled the banks, leaving tracks near broken lodges. Ranchers reported finding traps, cattle slipped through fence gaps and trampled new willows, leaving little shelter for the survivors. Still, the beavers didn't vanish. Within a year, fresh dams appeared. Mud and sticks rose from the floodplain, proof of stubborn animals refusing to give up. Even on a battered river, they rebuilt, one branch at a time. On the Ruiz Ranch, the old way was simple. Let the cattle graze where they pleased, riverbank or not. But after the floods and beaver setbacks, Ana Ruiz saw something different. She watched as every hoofprint near the waterline meant another willow seedling crushed, another dam edge collapsing into the current. So, she tried something new. With help from local conservation groups, Anna set up a rotation. Cattle grazed only in certain pastures at certain times, and fences kept them out of the river's most fragile stretches. The results were hard to ignore. Where cattle pressure dropped, willow shoots shot up, and beaver dams lasted twice as long before breaking apart. Anna's neighbors noticed too. They saw that sharing the river, giving plants and beavers a head start, meant better water for everyone through dry spells. The old standoffs faded into something closer to teamwork. It wasn't just about beavers or cows anymore. It was about finding a way for both to thrive on land that, not long ago, had been written off as lost. Not every river looks like the San Pedro, but the lessons travel far. In the Chesapeake Bay watershed, scientists tracked beaver ponds that trap between 5 and 45% of the nitrogen flowing downstream. Small ponds hold back a trickle of nutrients. Sprawling complexes act like natural water treatment plants, pulling out nearly half the pollution before it ever reaches the bay. Over in Rhode Island, beavers went from zero to more than 90 in just a few decades, reclaiming streams that had been written off for generations. These aren't isolated cases. Watershed Management Group, based in Arizona, now shares simple tools. Tree wrapping, flow devices, and strategic fencing with landowners from the southwest to the Atlantic coast. Dr. Emily Fairfax, an ecologist who studies fire and drought, puts it plainly. Beaver wetlands can keep rivers running, even through multi-year droughts. Wherever people give these engineers a chance, water lingers longer and landscapes bounce back stronger. The toolkit is simple. Work with nature, not against it, and let the wild do some of the heavy lifting. When beavers and controlled grazing are managed together, riverbanks recover, water stays longer, and biodiversity increases. Arizona's experience, echoed in places like the Chesapeake Bay, 
shows that nature-based solutions can revive landscapes once written off as lost.